Hello, welcome. We are starting uh, our next talk. Uh, our next speaker is Dennis McCogan, and he's going to talk about solving Python cholesterol issues in cloud infrastructure. So I hope you enjoy it. Hi, uh, my name is Dennis. Uh, so who am I? Uh, I'm a freaking speaker. I'm a Python open source contributor to various Python projects. I've started my work from OpenStack. You probably, if you do in Python, you probably heard about that. Uh, so if, it's, if you notice the name of the talk, it's all about the cold start issue. So what the cold start is, uh, Python is interpreted language. So we need to spend time in order to warm up an interpreter, execute your packages and modules, and then start executing your code in particular. So when it happens, so whenever you type Python module, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start your interpreter, execute your modules, starting from imports, then uh, execute the definition of your classes, functions, and etc. cetera. Um, so why the cold start happens? Uh, if you've been developing lots of, uh, you've been using and developing lots of Python libraries, you've been noticed that some developers put a lot of code into module init files. So basically, when you do import something, uh, if from import something, uh, you're gonna get that import, but along with that, you're gonna get whatever is in init files. Uh, so why should I? Why should you actually care about that? So. Um, Probably most of you have been working with Python as data science engineer, as uh, people who write scrappers, and etc. But certain of us uh, doing some hardcore Python networking programming. So, uh, the, but in particular, I'm developing a serverless platform. So for our customers, we actually uh, trying to build a platform which is very efficient in running uh, a code uh, for uh, with the interpreter languages. So we started with Python and Node in particular, and I'm responsible for any bits of Python code ever written as, as part of our open source solution. So um, if you do, if you if you launch your code in uh, in clouds, if you launch your code on the host platforms like, as a containers, as a clear VMs, as uh, any hosted uh, any hosted infrastructure, uh, you actually care for how long it does it take to start your code within the very constrained amount of resources. I'm talking about the CPU and talking about the amount of RAM. So as I told you, uh, the cold start happens when you start an interpreter. Uh, and uh, it happens because people then actually take a lot of attention in the, the way they write, the, uh, write their code because uh, in OpenStack, or OpenStack organization, we created a set of uh, uh, extension to Flake tools that actually checks whether your package, your library, or your, any bits of your code has a code into init files, which is uh, maybe good for some cases when it doesn't care where your code is being executed, but when you care about the infrastructure and the time it, it takes to start your code, you start considering about how efficient your code is. Um, and you, you should care because if you're working at a startup, you have very limited budgets. So you basically have to uh, identify what causes your, co or your code to spike on certain, uh, uh, on certain commands. So basically you need to figure out if, if your code is efficient or if it's not, and if it's not, figure out when it actually happens. So uh, if you've been familiar with Python 3.7, uh, the importance system, uh, the C Python implementation, the importance system has changed significantly. So for development, has, nothing has changed much. You still can do import something from package import th something. But uh, the importance system changed. That's why, for instance, uh, TensorFlow doesn't work with Python 3.7 because it just doesn't follow the new imported system internally. So as part of the Python 3.7, new library was introduced called importlib. Before, before that, it was named as uh, impl, if I can recall correctly. So you can read about that. Uh, there's a QR code. So also new things were 
added as part of 3.7 release, it was uh, a, a new tool which is called imports profile tools. You, you, you can start your code and actually see for how long does it take to, uh, of how many time your imports takes to uh, actually run. And the set story first, uh, we've been developing a serverless offering and uh, We've been developing various, uh, lots of libraries for our customers in order to let them write their serverless functions in various programming languages. And one of the things we've faced was that at very limited constraints, but in particular 10% of the CPU and 128 megabytes of RAM, your code, to, uh, the R library, which is built, was built on top of the one of the asynchronous HTTP frameworks, took almost eight seconds to start before even serving the requests. It was a very huge problem for us because our platform has a pretty strict uh, limitation, three seconds, period, nothing more. Uh, so we started to, uh, we apply, we used Python 3.7 in order to uh, use built-in importing profile, in order to figure out what actually takes almost eight seconds to start their, their code. So we need to figure out what uh, the use case of the users who run our serverless offering and the minimum tire for the serverless function was a container which was running on those constraints. As I told you, it's only 10% of the CPU and 128 megabytes of RAM of swap and kernel space. So uh, the first thing we've used was IHTTP and it didn't work well. Uh, HTTP took, by itself, it took almost uh, 4.3 seconds to start. Then we decided, okay, we need another asynchronous framework. Uh, let's use Sonic because it may, uh, it's, it's sad that it's supposed to be the blazingly fast HTTP framework. And it didn't work as well. It took almost 3.7 seconds to start, start as well. So, um, I'm not blaming any framework here, but we started to, to figure uh, to identify if the Python itself was taking much time to start on those constraints. And this is what we figure out. The Python, the async IO itself took almost 1.2.1 uh, second to start on those constraints, and the uh, the and async uh, and we figure out that we want to actually build a framework that would wouldn't take that amount amount of time to start on the, those limited constraints. And we figure out that there is a correlation between uh, the amount of modules in your syspass to the importing time in the particular module. So basically, uh, if you put a lot of modules in your syspass, this, the pace of the obtaining the particular mo uh, module instance is gonna, gonna, it's gonna increase significantly. So, um, we had the limit, as I told you, three seconds to start, and we've made a, a pretty s simple framework based on the uh, on the channels. If you've been developing Django or uh, any SGI framework, you're probably familiar with what the channels is. So basically, it's a wrapper on top of the async IO uh, protocol. So uh, we were able to build this type of the framework was, that was, be, was able to, to import its own code and start in uh, 2.5 seconds, which is less than three seconds, but still not that very cool. Uh, so what causes Python itself to go slow on the limited resources? Um, I would say stop blaming interpreter. If it goes slow, it's your code is slow. So you need to figure out like if your code is really efficient in, order, in terms of the resource consumption, and please stop putting code in init files because if I want to import something, I want to actually do this explicitly. And here's the one of the use cases. Um, AOHTTP. If I, if I want to start a simple HTTP server, I had to basically import WebSockets, AO HTTP, uh, AO HTTP, AO files, uh, and rather and lots of different type of libraries which I'm not using, but all of those are taking time to start. And that's what that was the case why we figure out that we would we don't want to work with IHTP or any other library because they've been importing so many unnecessary stuff, and that that's a problem for us. And also uh, the one of the curious thing that I've mentioned that stop 
polluting your syspath with unnecessary modules. So assume that you have a web server that you operates some business logic, but it continuously executes the only one business path. But the other ones are not kind of used, but you still have lots of imports for those business, business lo for that business logic, which is not being used, but it's still it's already in syspass, and you basically had to uh, uh, have to live with that. With the time, you your module is going to be uh, looked up in a syspass. So here's the simple example of the Sonic application. It's like a simple web server that returns you "Hello World" as a JSON, and this is what you get from the import profile. Um, don't read that. It's all unnecessary except the time. The, the Sonic took 3.01 three sec uh, 3 uh, 3 seconds to actually start. And this is what Sonic actually imported along with that. IO, IO files, web sockets, and test, testing fixtures. So tell me please, uh, if I need a simple HTTP server, why should I import web sockets and testing fixture, fixtures? It pollutes my syspass. I don't want to see that, though, that unless I actually want to use that. Uh, so how to make your code faster? Most of Python developers, and actually Python core developers, would tell you to do this. More RAM, more CPU, you're going to be fine. That's not the case. I'm really sorry for that. No. So um, the first thing you need to do, this is how your init file is supposed to look like. Oh yeah, it's an empty slide, because there's supposed to be nothing there. Um, so, since Python 3.7 has a importing profile, please develop a set of tools in order to gate your importing time in your CI CD, which is very important for other people. Because uh, you may say that all of that is totally unnecessary, but uh, if you're developing a library for yourself, please keep it private. Do not publish it. Do not say it's very useful. Like there are so many uh, pitching, uh, pitching articles on the medium. It's saying that our, lab our library is cool, but it, it, it's cool in terms of what? There's no explanation. It has high performance. High performance on what? So m many developers are testing their the software on their own laptops. Okay, you have four RAMs and probably 16 gigabytes of RAM, which is not fair for any other people who want to actually save some money on the infrastructure. Uh, so, and yeah, and the syspass has to actually remain clean. And I'm gonna show you how to actually make that clean. Uh, there's like, it's, it, it's gonna be a hack, but it actually works and it, it's more efficient than um, the regular importance system. Uh, and one of the very important thing for Python developers who actually care about performance of their code, test your performance on the low cost constraints. Because this is the only way you can, you can uh, get the results from the, not from the uh, request IO, but on the system IO. You will see that at some, uh, some uh, places your code doesn't work pretty fast. And probably this is what gonna cost, you, uh, what gonna break your business logic later. And they use uh, an import lab. So uh, import lab allows you to actually delay the import of the particular code for later. This is what makes your business, uh, your business logic actually stay clean from unnecessary work. Um, so for the library we develop for our uh, customers, we've used a pretty simple thing. We use import lab that actually uh, been taking a customer uh, modules and then start all necessary infrastructure applications, and then run customer's code only on the first request, but not before that. Because our code is supposed to be very efficient. So if we are sure that our code is efficient, that we can say that, excuse me, my dear customer, your code is not very efficient, and here's why. You're gonna show them certain statistics from the import lab. And here's the explanation of the hack I was actually been able to figure out, but it was, um, at, first time, at first case, I didn't believe that it actually works better. So as we used to, we put all our imports into the header files, um, but we can actually wrap the imports into the functions. You're probably gonna throw rotten tomatoes into me, say like imports in functions are bad, just go away from here. Uh, actually, 
No. And here's the, here's the example. So here's the two functions. One is, has a pretty simple import, but wrapped with the function. And there's another one wrapped with LRU cache. So um, just to let you know, even the pretty simplest implementation of LRU cache in the func tools works faster than lookup at the six pass. Um, at the scale, uh, LRU cache works faster than simple imports. And here's the, some visual, visualization of that. So uh, you may, not, may say that like there's a certain spikes, but uh, in general, they are equal. So this is the example of the, te of the experiment, this is the result of the experiment, which takes uh, a 10K imports wrapped with a function uh, and 10K imports wrapped with LRU cache. So uh, at the, as the result, uh, what we get, LRU cache works up to 39% faster than regular imports. So at the 10K, uh, almost 6.5 grams of imports are faster with LRU cache. And this is how it actually looks like. So uh, if you notice, there is a, a pretty tiny line which actually measures where the LRU imports and the regular imports uh, have has pretty dis uh, have almost the same time. But you can see that almost everything that stays at the right of that line is what our LRU imports is. So basically, if you do uh, a development of the efficient uh, web application, if you do a serverless, if you're familiar with AWS Lambdas, Google Functions, Azure Functions, and etc., you need to be very careful with Python code because it's gonna explode the, your functions. So you need to basically make them efficient in order to uh, save, some, uh, save some money on the uh, execution because every vendor is charged you upon the uh, execution time and the CPU ticks in general. So uh, this alt uh, ex experiment you can find on this link. Actually, I finished that probably a couple of, almost a week ago. And I was actually surprised to see such results with the imports. So, uh, and the final thing is like a huge disclaimer. Um, I'm not blame, blaming anyone, library developers, core developers. But you need, you need to be aware that we, ha we had a Python 2 version and Python 3 version. Uh, imports in Python 2 works faster than in Python 3 because, Python 3.7, because things has changed internally, but we haven't noticed anything about that. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Can you hear me right? Good. Uh, we have some time for some questions. So I see one here in the front. Uh, if you want to start a longer discussion, just uh, let's take it offline. I'm going to stay here around for, for some time. Hi. So one, one of the problems is, is that you're essentially having to pass and read all those modules when you're importing them. Oh, once again? What, one of the problems is that you're having to go through those modules that on the syspath, et cetera. Yeah. Could we not throw the entire thing at some sort of dead code elimination algorithm and just get rid of all the things that we don't need? Well, once again, I just to we, uh, just throw the entire thing at a dead code elimination algorithm and get rid of all the things we don't need before uploading our function to a serverless platform. Uh, that could work, but it's going to be a very, um, very specific for each application. You can't write like a unicorn algorithm that's gonna work for any case. It's more, it's simpler to actually write an efficient code and just keep, your, keep yourself away from imports you don't actually need. This is what actually happens to us. We had to actually rewrote the whole stack for the customer you know, to, to make this, his code work efficiently. And probably um, some things will change later with Python 3.7 with sub-interpreters where you can basically split your file. It, like it, if you can expect that your user will still follow the same pattern of the development, imports in the header co and code later, you can actually strip out imports and then execute them in sub-interpreter sub because you have a state of that which is gonna stay alive for the whole life cycle of your application. It could change, but it's still, it's in alpha. Probably we're going to see something new later this year until the 3.8 release. Thank you. Okay, uh, more questions? Uh, yes, so 
it, just to check my understanding, your the, the the thing that you're building for the the customer is somewhat similar to uh, AWS Lambda or Google Functions. So. Um, we build an open source project, but not the open source service. Yeah. So uh, we're uh, our project called a fan project. It's totally open source, and you can just try it right away. But in Oracle, or internally, uh, folks from the service department, they are building a service on top of that. So I, the, the question that was uh, the meat of my question is, um, do you know? Uh, presumably, uh, if people are trying to upload code written or serverless or Lambda functions to to AWS or, or Google Functions, uh, they could run into the same. They could run into the same issue. Do you know? Yeah, how, yeah, that, how that's Google that's totally the same thing. Do you know how that how Google and uh, and a sorry? That's all. Uh, it's the same for any serverless platform that runs interpreted code. It actually happens to Node.js as well, but I cannot provide you results yet. I'm still trying to figure out how, how to make it work because I'm not JS uh, guy. I was wondering if you know, have any idea whether Amazon and Google have solved it in a similar way to you where they essentially have They haven't solved that. Or? They haven't solved it at all. So it's, it's still there because uh, most of the Python community, for some reason, they ignoring the cold start issue because it's never been the case until the serverless actually sh have shown up. So. Uh, at most of the time, the performance of the Python has been increased by adding more RAM, basically. That's what, the, can, this what happens, to, uh, this is what you need basically to run your Python efficiently because almost all operations inside of the Python are not CPU intensive, they are RAM intensive. So yeah, just adding more RAM, it's gonna, it's gonna blow away this problem at all. But still, there's a minimum tire, there's a requirement to run code faster. There's one more, sorry. Yeah, I think there was another one here too. Oh, sorry. Yes. We're gonna left some time, I promise you. Uh, so one of the Pythonic uses of the init is to expose the public interface of your package to the person that imports it. Uh, are you saying we should stop doing that? Well, there is another safer approach. If, if a user wants to import your interface, then he should do it explicitly. Why it should happen implicitly? Like, there's a always, uh, there's like a weights where you have implicit approach and explicit approach. Like an implicit actually hides lots of things from, from you as a user, as like, as a customer, as the library user. So you basically had to read all the source code and understand what happens internally because like for some libraries, there are lots of um, dynamic imports happening in init files, but they still can happen in, yeah, yeah, I know, I've seen you. Yeah, that's true. That happens uh, often. Like in the various libraries, like uh, in Sanic, when you do import Sanic, you, have, you get at least like 25 imports being performed. For what reason? It's not only the uh, standard library imports, but it's uh, Sonic core imports. You can make the, that code efficient, more efficient. But still, there is a pushback for rewriting libraries to make them more efficient. Okay, we have time for one more question. Thank you. Just to build on what you were explaining about these 25 imports, uh, profiling such imports uh, can be challenging. Have you come across any tools that help uh, do that, or have you developed any tools that help you identify? I'm the actually working which right are now. Slow? Uh, I'm working on that right now because uh, that's a fairly new problem. As I told you already, that most of folks are doesn't care about that. But still, there is a huge community of people who want to deal with a cold start. Not in Python, like particularly, like for Docker, there's like a, a 300 millisecond delay on the container start, but you 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 get more with the interpreter warm up and your and your code execution not just the like the business logic execution but the code itself there's one more sorry yeah i'm, I'm sorry but we ah. are running out of time uh, so okay. if you want to ask him any yeah, just, questions yeah just take offline yeah you're yeah. going to be around i think you yeah said. yeah i'm here so yeah just let's take it okay thank you thank you for, thank yeah. you so much <laughs>